Well, we've made it. We have made it to the last section of the semester in our emergency remote learning. I really appreciate that you all have stuck with us, that you have um, been doing the reading, you've been watching videos, you've been making responses, I've enjoyed reading them, but we are almost finished. Um, I'll be honest, normally in this class we would take it up a little bit further. Um, I would have packed in more stuff, but because of the situation we're in, I cut out some stuff at the end, and we are going to end with um, largely with John Calvin and John Wesley, so taking this up with Wesley um, through the 1700s, but focused on a very specific question related to predestination and free will, I think of this as the lecture in which I get to make you all Methodists, so it's exciting for me. All right, I want to start though by doing a little bit of history and starting that by showing you what I assume is going to be a very, very scary chart. Um, this is a chart of um, the various religious families, if you will, or Christian families, um, Orthodox, Catholic, and then the many, many different kinds of Protestants. So all of this here, those are different kinds of Protestants. One of the, the Catholic concerns coming out of the Reformation was that if you gave people the ability to interpret the Bible without a authority to give them the correct interpretation, what you'd end up with is a lot of splits, that people would in fact not read the Bible the same way, and that they would split from each other. And, well, Catholics were right about that. And what happened after um, Luther's break was a subsequent string of breaks. There's a lot of them, and I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to walk through these kind of big four. Um, what I sort of think of the big four Protestant traditions that then lead to what we today call denominations. Um, so these are kind of theological families, the Lutheran family, the Calvinist Reformed family, the Anglican Church of England family, and the Anabaptist family. Over time then, those families become different denominations. So if you want to think about it like this, these are like kinds of food, burgers, pizza, sandwiches, some other place, <laughs> um, frozen yogurt. And then these are the f different franchises, right? So in the, what did I say these were? Hamburger family, you can go to McDonald's or you can go to Five Guys Burgers and Fries. Um, I wasn't trying to equate any kind of different value or goodness by giving one of them McDonald's and one of them Five Guys. You could switch them, whatever. Um, I'm going to say pizza, you know. Pizza Hut, Papa John's, right? So different ways of being part of this tradition. Now, what I should say is these denominations can be very, very different from each other. Um, and in fact, people who go to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America in the Lutheran family probably have more in common with people who go to the Presbyterian Church USA in the Calvinist family than people in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America family have in common with people who go to the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, um, at least theologically. Same here. Presbyterian Church USA has not a ton in some ways theologically in common with Presbyterian Church of America, even though they both trace themselves back to the same founders. Um, these two groups are considered more liberal, these are considered more conservative, but they do have a, a, the same theological tradition even though today they have a lot of different positions. Some of you I know of also are a part of non-denominational churches. Non-denominational churches say, basically, we aren't part of a franchise. We're the mom and pops of the religious world. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not part of theological traditions. Most non-denominational churches um, take some of their theology from the Calvinist reform side, and they take some of their polity the way they organize themselves, um, more from the Anabaptist or Baptist traditions. Um, some non-denominational churches really stay mom and pops. They have, you know, there's one church and it's its own thing. Um, some of these. I'm going to talk now about the differences between these three, four major theological families by talking about the theology, particularly the theology of some of their most prominent um, leaders. Um, in the in the early years. So we've already talked a lot about the first, that's Martin Luther. 
Um, and so I think it would be most helpful to actually contrast Luther with who came next. So even during Luther's lifetime, there was division among Protestants. And one of the major divisions happened with a group that we're going to call the Reformed. Their most famous theologian is John Calvin. John Calvin is actually a generation younger than Luther. He and Luther were not in direct conflict. Um, I'm not going to bother you with the names of the Reformed leaders that Luther was in direct conflict with, but John Calvin became the, the key theologian for this family. A few things separate the Lutheran and the Reformed families. One, and one of the early issues that separated the two, had to do with the sacraments. So in Protestantism, there are two sacraments, the Lord's Supper, that's the bread and the wine that Christians take during church, um, and then baptism. And for our purposes, we're going to focus right now on the sacrament of um, communion, or the Lord's Supper. These are all words that are used interchangeably. And I'm actually going to start with what Catholics said. So, According to Catholic understanding, there's bread and there's wine. And after the priest prays over them, the bread and the wine literally become the body and blood of Jesus. They don't change their outward appearance, so it still looks like bread and wine, but underneath that, they are the body and blood of Jesus. You are literally eating the body and blood of Jesus. And this was um, formalized in a doctrine that actually came from Thomas Aquinas called transubstantiation big word, but keep that in mind. You're really eating the body and blood of Jesus, and there's a sense that something is happening um, uh, to the, the, the bread and the wine themselves in a way that, that it's almost scientific, or they're, they're, they're making a claim about um, what's, what's happening to the elements. Luther disagreed with transubstantiation. He proposed something called consubstantiation. So the bread and the wine don't change, but Jesus is, famously for Luther, in, with, and under the element. So when you're eating the bread and the wine, yes, Jesus is really there, Jesus is really present, but he kind of thought about the, this idea that the bread and the wine change is kind of mumbo-jumbo, just unnecessary. He would think of a scholastic or medieval um, university speak. You don't need that kind of way to articulate it for Luther. Yes. God is really present. Um, when you take these, you're really, you know, having grace kind of brought into you, but you don't need transubstantiation. So the Catholic tradition was here on, is Jesus really present in the bread and the wine? The Lutheran tradition moves maybe here-ish. The Reformed tradition moves a step further away from the Catholic tradition. Sorry, where did I start here? Catholic, Lutheran, Reformed. What Calvin said was, yes, when you eat the bread and the wine, you are in the presence of, of God. You're in the presence of Jesus. But nothing at all has happened to the elements. It's not even in with an under. Um, one of my PhD teachers talked about this as kind of a holy elevator. Calvin talked about when you eat the bread and the wine, you're brought into the presence of God. It's like you're brought into this elevator and you're shot up to heaven for this moment of, of bliss in the presence of God as you eat. Nothing changes in the elements themselves. God is really present in that moment, um, but nothing's changed. So you've got the Catholic transubstantiation for Catholics, consubstantiation for Lutherans, heavenly elevator, I guess, for Calvinists. Another area where uh, Calvin and Luther disagreed had to do with um, how much they thought they sh you should be working on ridding churches, particularly worship services, of Catholic ritual, Catholic practices. They took different stands on this. Luther's stand was essentially this. There are things that we do in worship that aren't in the New Testament, that the early church didn't do. Um, for example, priests wear these really kind of glamorous robes. Luther's position was as long as the New Testament doesn't say it's wrong, it's okay to do. So as long as it's not outlawed by the New Testament, it's okay. If you want to keep that Catholic practice, as long as it doesn't contradict the Bible, fine. The Reformed tradition was more stringent. The position of the Reformed leaders was that unless a practice in worship was commanded by the New Testament, you should get rid of it. So did the New Testament say, thou shalt wear fancy robes? Well, it, no, it doesn't. 
Um, so then you shouldn't when you're leading worship. So that's the difference. Um, and as we'll see, John Calvin had a greater emphasis on Luther, on the sovereignty of God. Um, Luther might, wouldn't have disagreed necessarily with that doctrine, but Calvin takes it to a place that Luther was not comfortable going. Okay, so Luther, Calvin. They are both part of what we call the Magisterial Reformation. The Magisterial Reformation believed, and they shared this belief with Catholics, that the church and the state should work together, and that it was part of the responsibility of the state to make people believe correctly. Obviously, Lutherans, Calvinists, and Catholics all had different ideas about what those beliefs should be, but they shared a belief that a state, a polity, should all have one belief, and that the church was there to support the state, and the state was there to support the church. So they believed in something we call an established church, meaning the church would get tax money from the state in order to run. They all practiced infant baptism. Some of that was for theological reasons, but some of it too was this belief that if you're born into a Christian polity, you should be baptized, which is the initiation ritual of Christianity, um, as an infant, because eventually you should grow up to be a Christian because, you know, you're German or what have you. They believed that. That separates them, I'm going to skip over here, from a man named Menno Simons, another 16th century Protestant leader, but one who had differences from both the Lutherans and the Calvinists. He is part of a tradition that we call the Anabaptist tradition. The Anabaptists took the communion thing even a step further from the Calvinists. So, transubstantiation, consubstantiation, holy elevator. What the Anabaptists said is, the bread and the wine is just bread and wine. And God isn't even present, really, in the bread and the wine. These are symbols that remind us of Jesus' death. So when we, we participate in a ceremony, we're not eating Jesus or you know, consuming grace. It's a moment of remembering the death of Jesus for us. Anabaptists were also part of something called the Radical Reformation. Not the magisterial, the radical. And what the Radical Reformation said was that the state should not be involved in church affairs, that it wasn't the responsibility of the state to make people believe correctly. Um, in fact, Anabaptists, the early generations of Anabaptists, and Anabaptists still, though not all of their theological descendants, um, were pacifists. They didn't believe Christians had any business fighting for the state. So they really believed in a separation of church and state very early. For that and for other theological reasons, they practiced something called believer's baptism, meaning you could only be baptized as an adult or at least someone who was kind of able to make a commitment to Christianity because they didn't believe that just because you grew up as a German or just because you grew up in, in, uh, as, a, as a Swede that you would necessarily become a Christian, that nationality was not necessary as not a predictor of Christianity. Commitment was, individual commitment. Now, to be clear, everyone else also practices believer's baptism, so you know, any adult can be baptized in a Lutheran church or a Calvinist church or a Catholic church, but they practice infant baptism for people in their communities. The, what the Mennonites were saying, or the Anabaptists were saying, Mennonites after Menno Simon, the Anabaptists were saying is that we will not baptize infants, and we will only practice believer's baptism. All of these folks were on the continent originally. Um, some of the theological descendants of the Anabaptists possibly come out of the English Reformation and are called Baptists, although that's a complicated and disputed history. Um, but the key point here is these are all content on the continent of Europe, and they're having a, a legit theological dispute. What happens in England is different. Um, the English Reformation happened at the same time in the 16th century, but it was driven first and foremost by the King of England, Henry VIII, wanting to annul his marriage to his first wife because he didn't have a male heir and he had fallen in love with somebody else. This is a long, complicated story that I think is actually kind of interesting, but I'm not going to go into all of the details. Suffice, suffice to say that what happens in England is both political, politically driven, and then eventually theologically driven. What we call the Anglican or the Episcopal communion is in many ways a compromise. It's a compromise between Catholicism on one hand 
and really Calvinism on the other. It's a way of being Protestant because the Church of England under Henry VIII broke with Rome, so they would no longer respect the authority of Rome, which made them Protestant. But it wasn't willing to go in a fully Calvinist direction, at least not all the time. Um, famously, one of its leaders, a man named Thomas Cranmer, one of the, the first archbishop of the um, real Church of England as, when it became Protestant, crafted a prayer book or a um, service manual, the words people would say in service, that was gave nods to Calvinism, gave nods to Catholicism. Um, that trend became even more pronounced under a later queen, Queen Elizabeth, who really wanted to create a church that everybody in England could basically rally around. So the Church of England, the Anglican Church, what became in America the Episcopal Church, is a Protestant church that has some elements that seem fairly Catholic, has some elements that seem very Protestant. One of the people who comes out of the Anglican tradition who we're going to talk today about today is John Wesley. So again, Cranmer, same time period as Calvin and Luther. John Wesley is centuries later, so he lives in the 1700s. John Wesley was an Anglican priest, and he died an Anglican priest. He loved the Anglican Church, but he believed it had become complacent. So he started a reform movement that really focused on people practicing their faith. Um, Wesley created small groups of people, all of whom at that point were Anglicans, but who you know, co committed together to really focusing on spiritual practices and disciplines that would make them holier. Um, people accused him of being a person of a method, and rather than dispute the term, he just went with it, and his group became known as the Methodists. Um, again, a longer story here, but after Wesley's death, the group split off from the Anglican Church and became its own group called the Methodists. Um, the, the Methodists have a lot in common theologically with the, the Anglicans. Um, they tend, though, to be more focused on religious experience and piety um, and are less likely to be as focused on ritual practice as Anglicans. Um, one of the things that separates Anglicans and Methodists from Calvinists, as we'll see, has to do now with the doctrine of predestination, although I have to be careful here, and again, this gets complicated. Some Anglicans were more Calvinist than others. Um, this will make sense hopefully in a little bit. Some Anglicans, like Wesley, were very Arminian rather than Calvinist. But I would say overall, the Anglican tradition has tended not to follow Calvin on his strong doctrine of predestination that we'll talk about. They've also tended not to follow Calvin on the strong sense that unless the New Testament um, permits something or commands something, that um, it's, it's not okay. Um, they also tend, though, to have a kind of Calvinist understanding of communion, although some of them have a more Catholic understanding. Again, the Anglican communion wanted to be pretty broad theologically, and so you can find different emphases within that group. All right, now some of you are really freaked out right now because you thought, wow, that was a lot, and I can't keep all these people straight. Um, big picture. Luther, excuse me, Luther, right? Justification by faith. Calvin, we're going to talk about predestination, sovereignty of God. Episcopalians, what I want you to know about them is they try and have a middle path between Catholicism and strict Calvinism. Wesley, as we'll talk about, um, God enabling uh, free choice when it comes to salvation and being um, really committed to spiritual practice. Mennonites, or Anabaptists, believers' baptism, church and state shouldn't be involved together. All right, good? Less freaked out? Wonderful. All right, I'm just going to show you this slide and nod to it and say this. Everything that I just said talks about these religious families, Lutheran, Calvinist, Anglican, Methodist, Anabaptist. But when I showed you that really scary chart at the beginning, I said that 
um, people in those different families, say Lutheran and Presbyterian, can sometimes have more in common with each other than different groups within the same family can have. And that's because over the course of the last 300, 400 years, there came to be a different kind of divide, mainly in Protestantism, although you can see it also in Catholicism. And that's a divide between what we call theological liberals and theological conservatives. This is a whole other class um, or lecture. If you're interested in it, I can point you to some really good videos in a class called Religion in America that are currently posted because of emergency remote learning. Um, all I'm going to say here is that what happened over the course of the last 300 to 400 years is what theological tradition you were part of, Lutheran, Calvinist, on and on and on, became less important for how you understood Christianity than whether you were identified as a theological liberal or a theological conservative. Those aren't the same things as political liberal and conservative. They can be related, but they're not the same. And for our purposes, I'll just say that liberals tend to have more willingness to think about how what we know from science and sociology and all those kind of disciplines affect our understanding of what we read in the Bible. Conservatives work the other way. They start with the Bible and say, what does the Bible tell us? And then that tells us about the human world. Another way to say it is this. Um, and this is a spectrum, so I'm going to go on the very broad parts of the spectrum. Liberals start with this. Do people rise from the dead? Well, no, they, they don't. We know that scientifically. After you die, you're, you're dead. That's what that means. And so when liberals look at the story of Jesus, many of them, not all of them, again, it's a spectrum, but at least some of them will say, people don't rise from the dead, so Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead. The Bible must be saying that as a metaphor. Conservatives start with, well, what does the Bible tell us happened? Well, it tells us that Jesus rose from the dead. What does that mean? That Jesus rose from the dead. So now we have to think about how we consider all sorts of other things, um, science, evidence, and those kinds of things, in light of what we know about the resurrection of Jesus. Again, much bigger subject, but all I want you to get out of this is to know that if you have, say, you're in a family, and your grandparents are Lutherans and your aunts and uncles are Lutherans, but they believe completely different things. And you're like, but you're all Lutherans. How is that possible? It could be, among other things, because some of them are more liberal and some of them are more conservative. And that has more to do with how they believe in the fact that they both come from a tradition started by Martin Luther.